Everyone knows Crystal McCall. She's a, a, a recent and good friend of mine um, from um, our friends at Stanford down the road. Um, and uh, she'll be speaking about CAR-T's, of which she is one of the luminaries. Thank you. Thanks, you know, it was really uh, great to hear Ira's overview of this because, you know, pediatric oncology, our, our field, is trying hard to do everything we can uh, to benefit our patients from this immunotherapy revolution. And it, it seems clear that um, checkpoint inhibitors as single modalities uh, are not going to do it unless we find a way to stratify the very special uh, tumors. Uh, and and, and that, that, stud, that, that work is ongoing. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I think we know that our tumors are not responsive to single-agent checkpoint blockade. We don't know enough to even say if they're immune deserts or immune excluded. And, and so we really do need to learn more about the biology. And I think that as time goes on, uh, checkpoints will probably be part uh, of the solution. Uh, but rather than being a single magic bullet, uh, it's going to be uh, a, a combinatorial approach. And, and this is why uh, pediatric oncologists spend so much energy on CAR T cells. I mean, why would you mess around with these expensive, difficult to create modalities uh, if you could do something as simple as give an antibody? But I think we're working from the, the premise that there really isn't much of an, an, a natural immune response there to harness. So we have to trick the immune system uh, into making a new response. And once we get that made, uh, the hope is that we can and use some of these other tools to amplify it. So, um, you know, last year was just a watershed year um, in terms of cell therapy for the treatment of cancer, uh, exemplified by uh, Emily Whitehead, the literal poster child for CD19 CAR therapy. I mean, it was amazing that the first cell therapy approved for the treatment of cancer, the first gene therapy approved in the United States was approved for a pediatric uh, indication. And, and so we're just uh, so happy that, about this and hope that this is the beginning, sort of the tip of an iceberg. Um, and the remarkable thing about Emily's story is she got one infusion of a cell product in 2012. She's a young school-aged child here, and those cells are still circulating in her system when she's a preteen, five years later, surveying for the recurrence of cancer. So uh, by all accounts, this is magical in some ways. And so we've been trying to learn hard to understand what makes the magic happen. Um, what are the critical elements that are required for this kind of success? Uh, and we're unabashedly trying to do this, not just to try to you know, make more um, success in B-cell malignancies, but we really want to take the power of these therapeutics and move them into solid tumors. So what we've learned from this experience is that in order for the magic to happen, uh, you need high-level antigen expression on the tumor. The tumor cannot uh, lose the antigen. And those CAR T cells need to get in there and expand. And depending on the disease, turns out for B-cell ALL, they also need to persist for a long period of time. And if any one, either of those two uh, things do not work out, uh, you end up with these mutually exclusive, cause, mutually exclusive causes of relapse, either antigen negative relapse or uh, antigen positive relapse. So as we think about moving CAR T cells into solid tumors and making them more effective, uh, we've got a long list of challenges. It's not going to be uh, a home run, um, arguably like it was in B-cell ALL. Uh, and depending on who you speak to, you'll see a different list of challenges and maybe a different order of these. But from my point of view, we've got real challenges among, uh, uh, about the antigen, and we'll talk about that today. Uh, we've got challenges related to intrinsic T cell dysfunction, and I'll call that T cell exhaustion. And I want to distinguish that from extrinsic T cell dysfunction induced by the suppressive microenvironment, which is also a significant hurdle. There are also issues regarding trafficking. I won't touch on that today. But I also think we all talk about the challenges. There may be opportunities too. If you get a nice immune response, turn this tumor from a desert or an excluded into a hot inflamed environment, there may be endogenous antigens that could come in to uh, help recruit. And so there may be opportunities as well with solid tumors. So the target problem. You know, uh, it's been great to work with our uh, St. Baldrick Stand Up to Cancer team with the genomics brain trust that, uh, that is in that team and helping us to really uh, go into our databases and understand what are, the, what are the molecules that are overexpressed on the surface compared to normal tissue. And as John emphasized, of course, we all want to target a molecule that's important for the oncogenic process. And it seemed like ALK, anaplastic lymphoma kinase, would be a perfect target 
Uh, as this group knows very well, uh, it's a tyrosine kinase receptor, can activate multiple intracellular signaling cascades. Mm, you know, the adult community knows about it because it's a uh, partner in a, in a fusion protein, but full-length self-service ALK is expressed on uh, neuroblastoma frequently, uh, but also other uh, pediatric tumors. And, you know, work by Yael and the group at, at Dana-Farber really uh, identified it as an important oncogene in neuroblastoma, and Yael's been leading efforts uh, to directly target ALK. But, you know, when you look at the RNA-seq data, it's really beautiful because you have this essentially absent expression on normal tissue, and this gives you a lot of confidence that this is going to be a safe target, and, and you see this fold change, which is significant, and if you look at the cell lines, you do see consistent expression of ALK on the neuroblastoma or the other sometimes Ewing sarcoma cell lines. So, of course, we put a fair amount of energy into making a car to ALK, and uh, you know, given the antibodies that we had to work from, uh, we thought it was a, a pretty good car. It made gamma and other cytokines in response to the tumors. And then when we looked at the activity in the xenograft models, you know, it was statistically significant, but it wasn't impressive. It was clear you were not going to cure cancer with this kind of activity. And we scratched our head and said, what's really wrong with the ALK car? And uh, we questioned that maybe the level of ALK expression on the tumor just wasn't adequate. And so Robbie Mazur in the lab has been really diving deep into this question of how much target is actually necessary for the CAR T cell to effectively eradicate a tumor. And he does this by expressing different levels of the target antigen on the surface of a cell. And just for frame of reference here, here's your Kelly neuroblastoma cell line. It's positive, uh, but it's relatively low compared to these others that we tested. And you can see here in a simple chromium release assay, uh, with this range of expression, we saw very significant differences in the ability of the CAR T cell to kill. And uh, we then took uh, ALK and expressed it at high levels or at low levels on a leukemia cell line. And we like to do this because we want to get rid of the challenges of the tumor microenvironment. And if ALK is expressed highly on leukemia, this, this car looks pretty potent. It looks like a CD19 car. Uh, but if it's expressed at the levels that are found on these neuroblastoma cell lines, uh, it really isn't very potent at all. And you, you can now model this looking at various uh, measures of the CAR T cell functionality. We tend to focus on cytokine production because we think that the ability to make IL-2 in particular is really important for the CARs to be able to expand and persist. And you can see that there's a very tight relationship between the level of the target on the the level of ALK on the target cell and the degree to which the CAR T cell is able to become activated. And that's perhaps not surprising, but what is surprising is how many molecules you need to really get these CARs activated. We're talking in the thousands range. You're really not getting onto a plateau until you're beyond 10 to the fourth molecules. Um, now, this is very different than a natural T cell receptor, which can fire at very low antigen densities. It's one of the beauties of the, the T cell receptor. And so this was a surprise to us. Uh, and it, we've seen this in several models now, and it was also borne out in a clinical trial with the CD22 car. And so this problem of are we going after the right targets is, I think, one question that the field needs to ask itself as we reconcile the negative data we've had thus far uh, with CAR T cells for solid tumors. We're all looking for a CD19 that's so-called screaming on the tumor and absent on normal tissue, except perhaps an expendable tissue. But we tend not to find that. What we tend to find are classes of antigens that are what we call safe antigens. They're promising, and I would put ALK in this category. The normal tissue is very clean. Uh, the tumor is positive, but it's not high. There are always these other antigens, though, that you find. And you see them highly expressed on the tumor, and they're expressed on the normal tissue at, at levels that are certainly above background, um, but there really is quite a range and a differential expression. Uh, and I'm beginning to wonder that maybe perhaps these are not the ones where, with our currently, as the cars are currently engineered, uh, that we're going to get a lot of uh, mileage out of. Rather, these are the kind of targets that we may need to go after. And these, of course, are higher risk targets, tricky targets. Uh, and if we're going to do that, we need to have more sophisticated CAR T cells. We have to have cars that you can regulate or you can control because you really can't you know, take the chance in the clinical trial. But I think that the, the field has evolved to the point where we do have ways to generate CAR T cells uh, that we can regulate. 
So what are the kinds of antigens I'm talking about? Well, B7H3 is one of them. You heard about it today. Uh, Nikon's uh, 8H9 antibody targets B7H3 or CD276. Uh, we've been excited about B7H3 mostly because it has this very high homogenous expression on many pediatric solid tumors. And here's some data from the Vancouver Molecular Pathology Corps from our St. Baldrick's uh, team uh, generated by Paul uh, Sorensen. And you can see uh, these are neuroblastoma samples really very nice, high-level membrane uh, expression, and limited. Not, there's not absent expression on normal tissue, uh, but there's a, fair, there's a very significant differential level of expression. And we've been uh, generating uh, CARs to uh, B7H3. Uh, we have a lead candidate that we hope will go into the clinic next year. Uh, but just to show you, the B7H3 is also expressed on many other pediatric tumors, and we've got good regression data with medulloblastoma, osteosarcoma, uh, and Ewing sarcoma. Here's our data with neuroblastoma. We've got good activity, nice cytokine production, good killing in vitro, uh, and some regression uh, in neuroblastoma. So I think that B7H3 is definitely should be on the short list of these cell surface targets uh, that could be potentially uh, something you could go after with uh, any one of a number of these approaches. Um, now, of course, we all know here in this room that GD2, the GD2 ganglioside, is also differentially expressed. It's highly expressed on neuroblastoma, but it's also expressed on normal peripheral nerves and on the CNS tissues. Some of the other solid tumors also express high levels of GD2. And so uh, we certainly have been continuing to work to develop GD2 cars for neuroblastoma, and we also think they could be applicable for osteo, which we see very consistent GD2 expression. So just to sort of summarize briefly, this work was first developed by Malcolm Brenner and Martin Poulet, really published a seminal report in 2008 with a first-generation GD2 car tested in neuroblastoma. There were no co-stimulatory domains, just the CD3 zeta domain there. 19 patients were treated, 11 with active disease. Uh, the other eight didn't have disease at the time of treatment. And the car really didn't expand very well or persist very well. Um, but there was some evidence for clinical activity, um, mostly in disease that was non-measurable. So one transient clearance of the bar bone marrow and, and in a bone lesion, and then one PR. Um, and so this was, you know, exciting, but the concern was, you know, it could be more potent if you put co-stimulatory domains in there. And so what Malcolm did was generate a third generation that had CD28 and OX40, um, and he subsequently ran a trial with that, assuming that it would be more potent. And here we ran into a conundrum. It wasn't more potent. Um, whether he gave lymphodepletion or not, he saw limited persistence and giving PID-1 blockade didn't uh, enable these cells to persist. Again, there was no significant uh, toxicity, but now no significant clinical activity. And we ran an NCI trial with the same vector, basically very similar trial, and we saw very similar results. Um, best res response was stable disease. So this was disappointing. Um, now, with regard to the issue about toxicity, people will say, well, how can you, how can you say a car isn't toxic if you didn't see activity? And, and, you know, they certainly have a point if the cars don't exist. Expand. Uh, at the NCI, we really did see that, uh, and this isn't the complete data set, but just some uh, patients to show you, we did see that the GD2 car did expand. And I like to kind of put the immunokinetics up there and put this as a frame of reference to the CD19 cars, or uh, here's the pen, CD19 BBZ car. Um, we saw levels of expansion that were similar to what was associated with clinical activity in other cars. So I think if you were going to see toxicity, um, you, you might have seen it. Um, so we were reassured uh, that despite the kind of early significant expansion, we didn't see any evidence for neurotoxicity. Um, and again, these are consistent with the model that there's a therapeutic window, that these kind of antigens that are highly expressed on the tumor and show limited expression on the normal tissue will prove uh, to be safe antigens. So what's wrong with the GD2 car? Why didn't the co-stimulatory domains make it work better? Well, this was work done by uh, Adrian Long in my laboratory. We had created a GD2 car, really trying to mirror it off the CD19 car, just using the 14G2A single-chain FV. And when you just looked at killing, now we took osteosarcoma cells and overexpressed 19. So uh, again, normalize the playing field and take the variable, the microenvironment, out of there. We saw similar killing, but clearly, 
the GD2 car really couldn't do anything in vivo, whereas the CD19 car was able to effectively induce regressions. So it wasn't the tumor microenvironment. There was something wrong with the GD2 car. And this is what's wrong. It aggregates. This is making a fluorescently labeled version of the car. What you see is that the single-chain FVs can bind to each other, uh, so-called homotypic aggregation. That leads to signaling, uh, phosphorylation of the signaling domains, even in the absence of uh, antigen. And then when you have chronic signaling, of the T cell, you get this phenomena of T cell exhaustion, intrinsic T cell dysfunction, characterized by PD-1, TIM-3, LAG-3 expression. This is not unique to the GD2 car. The GD2 car was one of the worst offenders that we'd seen, but we saw it on most all of the cars that we looked at, with the exception of the 19 car. The 19 car is pristine. It doesn't do this. Whether that has anything to do with why it works so well, we think it might, um, but we know that this is a problem if you develop exhaustion very early, even before you administer the cells to the patient. And so this whole process of T cell exhaustion has been something that immunologists have been studying for many years. We know that one of the last things to go is the ability to kill, and that's why the killing was similar in the test tube. Um, but what you lose early is the ability to produce IL-2 and proliferate. Um, we were able to localize the exhaustion problem to the framework regions of the single chain FV by doing a switch experiment, taking the uh, framework regions of the GD2 car, putting them into the CD19 car, and indeed we converted the CD19 car to one of these cars that tonically signals. The problem was we couldn't um, do the reciprocal experiment because we lost the ability to bind antigen. So we've been working hard to mutate and you know, correct this single chain of fee, but the fact is it hasn't worked. Uh, what we've been able to do is to gradually make the car work better despite the tonic signaling. One way to make it work better is to switch out 41BB for 28. And the biology behind this remains not entirely clear. It may just be the strength of the signal. But when the BB is the co-stimulatory domain, despite the fact that this thing aggregates, you don't get the exhaustion at the same rate. These cells retain the ability to make cytokine. They have less uh, checkpoint expression. And indeed, they're able to control tumors uh, in vivo, at least when this was co-administered with cyclophosphamide. So there clearly was a difference. But it still wasn't the home run that you wanted, like with a CD19 car. So we've been continuing to work on how do we make this car work better. And one thing that we've recently stumbled upon is that small molecules, in particular desatinib, a drug that most of you in the room uh, are uh, familiar with, is able to inhibit car signaling. Um, here you've got uh, the phospho CD3 zeta with the tonically signaling car. And here's with the desatinib you see it's inhibited. So if you can inhibit the car signaling, now you've sort of uh, stopped the problem of the tonic signaling. And you can see that now your cars that are sitting in your test tube, rather than become effector memory within a few days, uh, now start to look like central memory, the kind of cells you want to give. And here's the checkpoint receptor expression. You can see it is substantially downregulated when the cells are cultured in the presence of desatinib. Now, these desatinib cultured GD2 CAR T cells actually work better. Uh, they make more IL-2, more interferon gamma, they kill better, and they work better upon adoptive transfer. Now, in the last few minutes, I do want to mention that uh, uh, this microenvironment issue is a, a major issue. Uh, we really don't understand exactly what the dominant factor is in pediatric tumors, but I think there is a significant amount of data that says that the myeloid-derived suppressor cell axis is alive and well in our kids' tumors. So we've been looking at myeloid-derived suppressor cells now in a xenograft model. And you say, well, why look in a xenograft model? You don't have the immune system. But as it turns out, um, these tumors, and here's an osteosarcoma versus a neuroblastoma, uh, what we're seeing here is that these tumors in xenografts are able to induce myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So the story goes like this. The GD2 expression is very similar. We see similar lysis with the GD2 car ex vivo, but when you look in vivo, the tumors are that are only the Kelly tumor, the neuroblastoma tumor, is able to be controlled, whereas the osteosarcoma grows as if nothing is happening. So what's going on here? The tumor is able to be killed in the test tube. It's not killed in vivo. What's the difference? Well, we saw that there was a big difference in the ability of these two tumors to induce myeloid-derived suppressor cells. In this case, the neuroblastoma did not do it. Um, but it was indeed the osteosarcoma that did it. Um, these were both granulocytic MDSCs. Now, these are murine. 
but they were also monocytic, and the murine MDSCs were able to suppress the human uh, T cells because these things work largely by nutrient depletion. That's not particularly surprising. And I don't want to imply that neuroblastomas don't do this in our patients. We've got several reports of expansion of myeloid drive suppressor cells in patients with neuroblastoma. I think this was just a phenomena of this cell line. But now we've been working on approaches to modulate these and inhibit these. And one way to do this is to use an old friend, all transretinoic acid, a drug that's been used in oncology for APML. Um, and indeed, when you give all transretinoic acid, you're able to induce differentiation of these immature myeloid cells uh, and really get rid almost completely of the monocytic compartment. The granulocytes don't disappear, but they uh, actually showed it less suppression. And so when you look at your CAR T cells, you do see some, whoops, some impact of giving the ATRA uh, to these. It's not uh, transformative, but it's incremental. And I think uh, it's one point that I want to put out there that uh, I think CD19 CAR for BALL, that was transformative. For the solid tumors, we're going to have to chip away. We're going to have to start with something, we're going to have to add something and add something more. I would love to have a transformative modality, but I'm, I'm willing to chip away at it if that's what we have to do. So my summary points, target antigen density, it's a critical factor impacting the efficacy of CAR T cells. And I think the way we're making CARs today, we may be able to engineer their ability to go after lower antigen density, but the way we're making them today, you really need high levels of antigen if the CAR is going to work. And that means it's bad news because antigenic heterogeneity will get you, but it's good news because it means some of the targets are on the table that you might have thought uh, you would not be able to go after. Um, many cars, including our old friend, the, the GD2 car, um, are limited by this problem of tonic signaling. And giving a 41BB costim helps the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. And we've got this new data that desatinib uh, is another way that you can uh, modulate this uh, by inhibiting intrinsic signaling. And then so, uh, finally, the suppressive myeloid cells are probably an important axis for suppression in pediatric tumors. And we've demonstrated that co-treatment with ATRA can diminish levels of these uh, in an animal model. So we're going to plug all this together and planning a clinical trial with our n hopefully new improved version of a GD2 car incorporating a BB, uh, culture the cells into satinib, and incorporate ATRA post-infusion. So this is my laboratory, uh, my funders, and, and uh, I want to just highlight that, you know, Robbie Maisner has been really leading the effort on the uh, antigen density story in my lab. Evan Weber dis discovered the uh, desatinib effect, and Rachel's been working hard on the... Um, uh, exhaustion. Mina is working uh, in the lab on uh, B7H3 cars and optimizing cars for neuroblastoma. And I want to highlight the work of the uh, investigators in the NCI Pediatric Oncology Branch, who I remain close collaborators with, and these folks that were in my lab at the time that some of this data was generated over at NIH. And then, uh, importantly, as John alluded to, this uh, St. Baldrick Stand Up to Cancer team, uh, which has just been incredible to work with. And uh, thanks to John and Paul and the rest of the PIs. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Crystal. As you and I have discussed um, with Robbie, I think it's, you know, we think a lot about antigen density and receptor threshold that's required to be amenable to CAR or T cell approaches. And, and I think the other important consideration is the models that we use to look at that. So, what we have found in, in my lab, and I think uh, others have found as well, is that when you look at expression uh, of an antigen, say, ALK in P PDX models, it's very different when you take a MEX-VIVO and look at the expression even in matched cell lines. It seems to be downregulated in the cell line. So I think that um, you know, those models are likely more appropriate to test the yeah. you know, activity yeah. of CARs. We've seen that also for DLL3, for example. Yeah, I think the immunologists have got to partner with the tumor, you know, with the you know, the cell biologists, um, you know, we, you know, you, you got to use the right model. Uh, the way immunologists do science, some, we've kind of had to move along and, and stop using our old cell lines and xenografts. And so thank you, Yael. It's a very important point. I think we have time for one more question, probably. Or I got to get Iris, too, after yeah. John. Okay. Well, just really quick, I know, th I know the answer is probably I don't know, but how is a dirty kinase inhibitor inhibiting T cell exhaustion? Yeah, well, you know, we, I don't know why we thought that the car didn't hijack any of the T cell uh, signaling domains, but it's hijacking a fair number of them. So we haven't kind of nailed it, um, but it's, it's probably inhibiting a SART kinase in the T cell that is 
unexpectedly required for car signaling. Ira. Similar to that, um, I mean, the process of exhaustion is probably one and the same with TCR-induced death. And so uh, depending on how you construct the signaling molecule, you may be activating that. Um, to a large extent, you can kind of block that just by blocking the MAP kinase pathways. Have you ever tried to use a MEK inhibitor or some, or some such thing? Yeah, we haven't. You know, we've, some of the work we want to do is some screens with small molecules. I think in the car field, this is kind of the, the new thing. Everybody is using small molecules uh, to modulate these. We haven't used MEK inhibitors, but it's a good idea. Thank you.